I'm glad you can join us this fine, brisk morning. Wow, it's cold. I left the house this morning with just my shirt, and I turned around and it's like, no, <laughs> jacket. So I'm a little out of breath. Something I wanted to clear up from last week, because the people at home were watching the video and stuff like that, uh, I, I'm a silhouette, so you can't really see me. And last week I mentioned that we had a wonderful governor in uh, the state of Washington. I was, I was, I was being sarcastic. Um, so I don't really believe that. So I just wanted to clear that up. Uh, it's funny because I, I, I was asked, did you say that? I was like, I don't remember saying that. And I watched the video, and I was like, oh, sure enough, I said that. And since I'm like a silhouette, you can't really see my face. So, uh, so I mean, it, it sounded like I said that when you just watch a video. But you have to be here in person. <clears throat> uh, so this morning, I would like to, for us to think about has something to do with the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of people confused about the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. We need to come and understand that the Holy Spirit does not work in a vacuum, but He works through the lives of believers, which is the body of Christ, which makes up the church. When we look at the first church in the book of Acts, we witness His example, which is set up, set up before us to see a church that was built upon the foundation of God's Word. A church was, which was built upon st strong fellowship. And a church which made prior, uh, prayer a priority. When we look at it, the book of Acts pa paints for us a very happy picture. We see earlier on the Apostle Peter preached and about 3,000 were added to the church. It's a start to something completely new. Something the apostles have never done before. But it looked like a smooth start. People were happy. They came to know Christ. And lives were changed. And, you know, we really have to read this. Because it's exciting. It's really, really, truly exciting. Remember, this is something that's never happened before. Oops, backwards. Right? But that's not the exciting part. Because this new ministry didn't really matter. You might think, what do you mean it didn't really matter? It didn't matter, you see, because what's important was that the Spirit of the Lord was at work. Without that, what would you have? When you think about it, this was a promise from the, uh, God, God the Son, which was fulfilled to us. A promise which was given in John 15, 26. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, namely the Spirit of Truth, who comes from the Father, he will testify about, about me. Now the disciples didn't know what they were waiting for. But when he came, the only, the only thing you can think is, wow. Does God keep, keep his promises? Yeah. You know, the amazing thing is what happened. And we, like I said, we've got to read about it because it's so exciting. We're going to jump to Acts 2. We're going to read 37 to 47. And we're going to start off by looking at the works of the Spirit. The product of what He did. His fruits. I mean, we go through this. I mean, really, really think about this. And you should be hearing me, but you should be reading it out of your Bible. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart 
and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what are we to do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you will be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and all those who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on urging them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized. And that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling this sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all the believers were together and had all things in common. And they would sell their property and possessions and share them with all, to the extent that anyone had need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from the house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God for having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. How do you feel when you read this, when you look at this? Yeah, they should have that joy and wonder. The Bible says that they were together, they were glad and sincere of hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. God was with them, and he was working through them. And it's clear that the success was not the result of some skill, smooth talking, or some kind of marketing plan. It wasn't some fun program that brought people to Jesus. There wasn't any program. Actually, all there was was the preaching of the gospel. Isn't that amazing? Just a plain, simple gospel message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity we have to come together and to worship you, Heavenly Father, to praise you for all the things you've done for us. This morning, Heavenly Father, as we look at the first church and the example set forth for us to follow, that we will see these things, Heavenly Father, and want to follow in the footsteps of what came before. We just thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word, and we just ask that you be with us this morning. Amen. So there wasn't any fancy program, any tickling of ears, or any marketing ploy. This growth came because the Holy Spirit was present, and he was working through the disciples and through the believers, just as he works through the church today. See, the circumstances around them have not changed. The authorities were still against the people of the way. That's what they were called, people of the way. And they were still under persecution. We see later one of them, Stephen, who was stoned to death in public. Yet nothing could stop them. Or to put it in another way, nothing can stop God. Because if we notice a change in these men, from the frail, weak men of faith that they were, to the pillars of the faith that they became, it was and is all God. Remember when Jesus was crucified? Where were these apostles? They were hiding. And look where they're at now. They weren't scared. They weren't afraid. They had the strength of the Lord with them. I'm trying to think of when we... Uh, I think we were talking about that on Wednesday. You know, it, it's so different... Before you're saved, how you feel, what's your priorities? Oh no, we talked about it yesterday at men's breakfast. 
right? And then the change within us once we receive the Spirit. Our whole focus change. Our priorities change. Where we're trying to fill that hole in us with all kinds of other things, we have the Lord. We need nothing else. We're satisfied. Before you have them, you're never satisfied. You always have to, whatever that vice is, you're getting this or that, like we see the world today. They're always putting, trying to fill that void. That void that it can only be filled with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should know that nothing can or is going to stop what God wants to be done. So this makes me think, and let me ask you, I wonder, what does God want done here in Bonanza? Frankly, there's nothing that can stop him or his plans. The big question is, can we trust him to do it? There are some things that these people we see in Acts, they were devoted to. And these things are very important. Look at uh, Acts 2.42. It says, And they were continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. So we want our lives to be filled with gladness and joy. Always praising God like these people. Then we need to be devoted to these things. The Spirit works through these things. Remember, the Spirit doesn't work through a vacuum. First, we need to build a foundation on God's Word, the Apostles' teaching. Some people think, well, don't we already have this? That's a good question, do we? Sometimes we believe we do, but unfortunately what happens in our foundation, the foundation we have in our lives, is a hodgepodge of teachings. There's a big hole, and we just throw this, throw that, this and this. What kind of foundation is that? Have you ever seen somebody lay a foundation with a bunch of, you know, broken concrete, and, you know, they just throw any, everything in this pit, and then they build upon it? Is that solid? There's some from here, some from there, then we put it all together. What do we say? No bueno, right? Not good. That isn't a foundation, it's a mess. Look, change only takes place within our lives by the study of God's Word. This is how we build our lives, on the foundation of God's Word. So there's so many people in churches today that are not strong. And that's because they didn't eat well. And what I mean by that is they're not taking enough of God's Word. We need to be taking in God's Word constantly, as much as we can, as often as we can. Otherwise, what? I hear, well, I don't like to read. I didn't ask you that. Well, it's boring. Are you saved? Well, I don't understand. Have you asked for a hand? I mean, I keep saying it over and over in all the different things we're involved with. There's all kinds of excuses. Right? And I'm not going to stop saying. I'm going to keep saying until people understand. There's no excuses, period. If you're saved... Right? And you have God's Word. You're saved. When you think you're saved. And I don't like to, I don't like to read. How are you going to grow? I would ask myself, are you saved? Because you don't, once you're saved, you have this hunger. Even if you don't like to read, you know what? The Bible's so different. Once you start getting into it, it's not about reading. It's about learning about God and applying that into your life. Yeah, you discover treasure. And it doesn't become boring. You're excited about it. You want to learn more. You want to grow more. You want to glean more from it. That's what it's about. If, you know, and as, like I said, I've heard people tell me that, oh, I don't like to read. 
Well, I mean, I would have some questions for you. You need to be in God's word. Now, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to say that you need to be in the Bible 24-7, which wouldn't hurt anyways. But you see, when we're in the Bible, we benefit so much from it. We strengthen our relationship with Him and with each other. It reminds us of what God is saying to us. Remember, His instruction booklet. You can't live life without instructions. It, everything's in here. Yep, we teach the kids basic instructions before leaving Earth. This is your instruction booklet. This is to help you through your life, to help you grow, to gain knowledge. It's about growing that relationship from God's wisdom so that our lives will be fulfilled by glorifying Him. We're living in very challenging times today because we're bombarded with all kinds of information and voices of all kind, from radio from, to the web, to TV, to YouTube, to TikTok, I mean, you name it. And we, this morning in Sunday school, we named quite a few. Now think, you have God's word, right? And God's word is competing with all this other information you're getting from all over the place. They're coming at all different angles. Every day, relentlessly and unforgiving. You know what? All these other messages that you're getting from other places, they don't care about you. These messages are an effort of the enemy to get you to draw away from God. That's all it is. It's a ploy to get you away from God. To put questions, to make you doubt. If you're in God's word, I'll tell you, you have no question of a doubt of his word is true. And that he keeps his promises. And what awaits us to, to the life to come. But you, like I say, you get all these messages from all these other things. That, is that like that mural in, uh, in Genesis? Did God really say that you would surely die? Right? Putting doubt in your minds. That's the way he works. You need to be aware of that. That's why, you know, we need to retreat. And I mean to go for a retreat. To have a quiet time. Where you can get away from all this noise, all this stuff that you hear and listen. And only listen to one voice. The voice of God. And how do you hear the voice of God? It's only through His Word. If you're, if you're interested in hearing the voice of God, and you're watching these, do you think you're going to, these, I'm sorry. <laughs> all these people are watching all these TV programs and stuff, or movies and stuff, and thinking, well, I'm a Christian because I watch The Chosen. It's a TV series. I've watched The Son of God. It's a movie. Okay? Those are things to entertain you. If you want to know the truth, there's only one way. You need to open this up. There's no other way. You know, there's all kinds of ways we can get into God's Word when you're driving to work. Right? You can put a... Um, yeah, audio book. Uh, audio uh, Bible. You can hear it on your way to work. What do, you know, especially here when you're driving 20-something miles to work, right? Isn't that refreshing? You can get 20-something minutes of the Bible. Or with you guys who are driving farther away, the truckers and stuff. Yeah, I mean, how to be... You're, you're driving, it's all long distance, a lot of stress, but how soothing it is to just listen to God's Word and be refreshed. Not Huh? Not K love. <laughs> We're talking about reading his. I mean, hear, reading and hearing his word. Oh. 
We need to not be led astray by fallible te the te fallible teachings of man. We need to get that bearing our bearing straight. Remember last week we talked about, I mentioned that battleship that we spoke about last week and the lighthouse. We need to, we need to realign our bearings to what's important. We need the living water and we need it constantly. If you've been to our house, you've seen all of Grace's plants. I've learned that when you see the leaves kind of turning down, something isn't right. <laughs> right? It needs something. It needs water. In fact, when you see them turning a different color, uh, it's too late. That plant has been in need for water for a long while. And guess what? I'm in trouble. <laughs> But, you know, I forget. How I wish you can just simply water it once and say in a week or two, still a, a month, right? But that's not going to work. The plant will wither. And grace will find out. And I just can't get rid of these plants because it's funny with her. She has her fibromyalgia. We can watch a movie a hundred times, and for her, it's always the first time. Like, oh, wow. She gets all excited because it's, it's like the first time for her. But move one of her plants, or one of her plants is missing, she knows it. I'm like, man. So, anyways, I've learned that the plants, plants you've got to water a little bit every day. And it's not easy to keep them green. It's not easy with your life either. To stay healthy and strong, you need to quench that thirst of your spiritual life. And it has to do with the Word of God. It needs to be done regularly and consistently. There are no shortcuts of having a healthy, green, growing plant. Just as like there's no shortcuts of how having a green, vibrant life in Christ. Regular feeding ensures our strength remains and our growth will continue. The next thing we see from the church is that they built a strong fellowship. Today the world has never been so more connected. Right? Companies have laid out millions of miles of fiber opti opti optics. We have satellites shooting into space. We have all these waves. Just imagine all these waves flying through the air. There's kids around the world that are texting each other on these mobile phones. You see, but people are living in isolation. They're getting more and more disconnected. Loneliness is a major problem today. Why? because our fast-moving lives have created a problem of relationships. We don't get nearly as close to each other as we did a generation ago. In the cities today, people can go for years without even meeting or greeting their neighbors. And we think, how sad is that? But do we realize in the church today, many people pass each other who don't even get to know each other. And this is a church. Here in Bonanza Community Church, we have fellowship, fellowship time after church. It's it, an opportunity not to sit with a little click, but to move around, meeting and greeting others. And it's such a blessing to see people talking and intermingling. Grace and I have been to many churches where we see cliques formed, where people sit with their little click all the time. We are a family and we shouldn't be living, we should be living out Christ in our life every day, even when we're together. Here in Bonanza Community Church, we have various opportunities to hang out together, 
just to talk, to play games, to share a meal. It's a coming together. It's a building of relationships. When we do a game night, people, some people are playing games, some people are cheating. Grace. <laughs> If you play a game with Grace, just be aware that she, she calls it creative playing, but yes. she cheats. But it's a time to just have fun together and, and grow together. You know, it's a time to eat together. On Wednesday Bible studies, Grace usually makes something for us to eat, and it's not about just eating. It's just ha having time together and sharing with each other and just, just hanging out, building that relationship, getting close to each other. If you haven't had a chance to come out to one of these things, you should. Remember, we were created, created for relationship. Not only with God, but with one another. In fact, we see one of the first things God said, it's not good for man to be alone. God said that humans were not made for isolation. We were made for fellowship. Why? Just think. We were made in the image of God. He's a three-in-one, triune God. The Bible also says that God is love. And to love, you have to have someone to love, right? This is what we're striving here at Bonanza Community Church. And to keep, that, that, to keep it that way, as we're learning, going through 1 John on Wednesdays, to love one another. On New Year's Day, I mentioned we're in a new season, a new year, and a new birth. This is kind of a recharging period for us. I would like to see and to get everyone committed to one time a month meeting together. And the purpose is just to be together and to build. We all need that refueling and recharging. We need to meet to love one another, inspire one another, to pray for one another. And it starts by getting to know one another. And this is what I'm getting at. Hey, I know Johnny. He comes to my church. But actually, no, you don't know Johnny. It's like people who tell me all the time, well, I believe in God, but they don't have any type of relationship with God. I know of Johnny, I have no relationship with him, and that's the problem. So how can I truly love Johnny if I don't know him? How can I inspire Johnny if there's no relationship there? How can I even pray for Johnny if I don't even know who he is? That is relationship. You know, Grace can look at people, not to scare you off, but Grace can look at people and she says, what's wrong with, almost, what's wrong with Doug? I don't know why. I don't know, it's just something he's off. And I say, hey, Doug, what's wrong? And he'll tell me something's wrong. I'm like, I don't notice it, but Grace picks these things up. That's why she's such a good partner for me because she notices things that I don't. I, I mean, I wish I could improve on that. And I'm saying we all need to improve on that. But we need to get to know each other so we can tell. This relationship, relationship, relationship. That's what we need to build to become truly family. And not just a name. Right? When you say, oh, I go to Bonanza Community Church, it's family. It's not just, oh, I just go to that church. That's my family. That's where I know everyone. I know Corbin. I know D uh, David. Right? I know them. I can pray for them. I can pray for James. Right? Relationship. Then again, and then we'll get into this frame of thought where we're thinking about 
family, unity, we're thinking about churches. I'm speaking of the local church and the local body of believers, the body of believers that we see in the Bible. When these writers are calling for unity, it's in the frame of the local church. It's here. Let me put it this way. Thursday with the kids. We're talking about, to them about serving God and being obedient to his word. And this is something very important for them to learn. Now the niche is, and which I told them, where does it begin? If they want to serve God and they want to be obedient to his word, where does it start? In their home. Our goal is to reach lost people. But if we're not family here, if we're not united here, how are we going to reach anybody? And that's what I see all too much. People wanting to do a lot of things, but you know what? When you come from a dysfunctional family, right? Anybody come from a dysfunctional family? How can you go out and reach anybody else? You need to work at home. You need to be united here in this church, this local church, Bonanza Community Church. We need to become one here. We need to become family here. There's a thought. Well, we need to be in unity. The Universal Church. That's fine and dandy, a good thought. But if it's not happening here at home first, what is it? Everything starts at home. This is your home. This is where it needs to start. You need to support, support your local church first before you go out and try to support other things. When you're on a plane, right, the, the stewardess, you can't say stewardess nowadays, whatever they're called. Those people <laughs> that work for the airlines, they tell you about your seatbelt and they tell you about this droppy thing, the air hose. They always tell you, put yours on first bef before you put on the person next to you, right? You need to, we need to take care of us. We need to come together first before we can help somebody else. Now the Holy Spirit works through lives to touch lives. And it's only when we come together first then this, that this can happen. Do you know that plan? That we need to be united here before we can help others? Satan see, seeks to separate us, to keep us separated. It's like that cold bean, you know, I was barbecuing yesterday, right? I had to put more charcoal in because it was really cold and it wouldn't light. But some of the charcoals were off to the side, they never lit. Why? Because they weren't a part of the, the embers. We need to join in fellowship as often as we can. We need to stay in family. It's the only safe place for us to be. Then when we look at Acts 42, 242, the last part says, and to prayer. We need to make prayer a priority. Prayer is a conversation that turns our salvation into a close relationship with God. In the book of Acts, it doesn't tell, tell us how, how the apostles evangelized what they did or how they did it. But what's mentioned is that they prayed. They were praying as a group before Pentecost. In Acts 2, we see more than 3,000 con converts. They were devoted to prayer. Let me mention a few of the occasions we see in the book of Acts of prayer. In Acts 6, they prayed when they elected the deacons. So the apostles can devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. In Acts 4, uh, 6 to 4. In Acts 10, both Cornelius and Peter were praying. 
Cornelius at Caesarea, and Peter at Joppa. And the Spirit spoke to both of them, eventually leading Peter to Cornelius, his home, where he preached the gospel. In Acts 12, Peter prayed when he was imprisoned, and the church prayed. In Acts 13, they prayed to send Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas were praying and singing in prison. It was something they did at all times. It was something that Jesus did all the time. The characteristics of those who pray often is that they are regularly at it. It's habitual. And they understand it's the most powerful use of their time. And it has become the first confession of their heart. The truth is, without prayer, we're without power. You can have a well-designed engine, but without fuel, it's not going to work. The Spirit of God works in response to prayer. Grace and my family, Grace, my family, and I have a host of dedicated prayer warriors who have prayed for us for years. They're involved in every single thing which the Lord has used us to accomplish for His glory. Prayer is God's design, designated as His designated way to release to releasing His will in the life of a believer of a believer. But do you know what the secret really is? The secret to all this? Are you ready? Because I'm going to give you the secret that everyone wants. I sort of shared it last week. The secret of prayer. The secret is to pray. And that secret to, to answer prayer is found in Psalms 5.3. I went over this last week. Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait expect expectingly. You have the confidence that God will answer. So you find yourself waiting expect expectingly for the answer. That's it. So you see the Holy Spirit, He works mighty in the early church through their devotion to God's word, through fellowship, and through prayer. Those are the three things that we need to build our community, this church. It needs to be built upon the foundation of God's word. It needs to be built upon the strong foundation of the body. And, in the need, and we need to make prayer a priority within the body. Simple on paper, harder in person. But it's not really hard. We just need to do it. This week, ask yourself, how can we come together more closely as family? How can I get to know Johnny better? Is there someone in the church that you've seen but don't truly, really know. We have fellowship afterwards. Sit with them. Hey, how are you doing? How's everything been? And you know, if you're, if you're Johnny, don't say, don't do like I do. Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> That's our, what we always say, right? Oh, I'm fine, I'm good. If you want people to get to know who you are, you need to share who you are. I really appreciate prayer for tomorrow. I got to go to Medford for that ultrasound and the other thing. My blood pressure is still kind of triple digits up and down. So, and I've had a headache for a couple of days because of that pressure. But I got med my meds yesterday, so I appreciate prayer for the trip over tomorrow to White Sands, the VA clinic. So, appreciate that and. Pray for each other. Continue to lift, lift each other up. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come together and to see the things that the first church was involved in. We just ask, Heavenly Father, to help us to place our foundation on your word, to build that fellowship, and to permeate it with that prayer. We just thank you, Heavenly Father, for all you do for us in our daily lives. And we just ask, Heavenly Father, just continue to help us to grow in you and to come closer to you. We pray all these things in your personal name. Amen.